Hey there, in this video we are talking about options for formatting your console input and output in C++. And this covers sections 3.7 and 3.8 in the Gaddis C++ book. So C++ does have some nice options for formatting how your input looks to the user, how your output looks to the user, and that'll help us make better interfaces going forward. Um, so this should be pretty useful. Before we can do that, first of all, we have to understand something first, and that is calling other functions in C++. Um, everything we've been doing so far is inside the main function, as we call it. There's lots of other functions built into C++, and we need to know how to interface them at this point. So a function call looks like this. Somebody else has written a function for us to do some kind of interesting job. It'll have a name. And when you want that to happen, you're gonna write down the name of the function, parentheses, and whatever kind of parameters or information that function needs to do its job. So what is that really? Functions are predefined collections of statements that maybe somebody else wrote previously to do a specific task. The idea is very much like mathematical functions. So for example, in a math class, you'll see something like f of x being defined to be the operations two times x plus five. And so this idea is very similar, and you're gonna see parentheses get used to indicate a function just like this. We would not name our functions a single letter like f. Again, just like variables, we wanna give them a full expressive name that's a full English phrase. Um, when you call a function, any required parameters are placed in those parentheses. Um, and then what actually happens is uh, when the code hits that spot in your program, calling the function jumps the program control into the statements of this named function someplace else in the system, runs the statements that are inside it, and then returns back into your program at the end, probably returning a single value. Just like a function, right? That's actually what a mathematical function means is that it's, it only has one single response for any particular input. Same thing here. Let's just think about that in terms of the math function, right? If I ever wrote down f parentheses three, mentally what I'd do is I'd jump into that math function that is on screen right now. I'd replace all the x's with three because that's what I put in the parentheses. I'd look on the right hand side and I know that I then have to do two times three plus five. And two times three is six plus five is 11. Then I come back to my original piece of math writing and I know that the result is 11, okay? And that mental process is exactly physically what a computer program will do when you make a function call like that. So C++ comes with many, many libraries, any language does really, of useful predefined functions. In order to access them, you have to include the correct definition header file. Like for example, so far we've been using the sin and the count object, and that's why we needed to pound include IO stream, which defines those objects. So for all the other things, that are in the C++ library, you will have to know what library to include to get access to that stuff. Now at this point in the class, again, we are only calling functions that somebody else already wrote. Later in the course, near the end of the class, in chapter six, we're gonna be writing our own functions, which will be useful for a lot of reasons, but that'll come later. Okay, quick example. Okay, I just wanna give you an example of a function you might wanna call. The pow function, right? That's short for power or exponent. So the name of this function is pow. It's a very old function. They named it short in those days. And inside the parentheses, it takes two parameters. The first parameter is the base, and the second parameter is the exponent to do a power job. And the point is the function pow computes real valued powers, or exponents, you might say. Now, this function is in the C math library. That is a library that was originally written for the C language, right? the math library for C. And uh, that is where all your interesting mathematical functions are, starting with POW. Uh, the base and the exponent in the parameters, the two parameters separated by the comma, are both treated as doubles, so they can have decimals in them. And ex for example, in C++, if you write down POW parentheses 4 comma 2, your base is 4, the power is 2, run some statements inside the code that somebody else wrote, and it's going to return with the number 16 technically a double, so it's technically 16.0. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, at least in our class, we've done one lab in the past where I think we wanted to compute the area of a circle. And um, since we didn't know about this yet, we were forced to write down pi times radius times radius, right? So now if you wanna find 
the square of the radius, you could write down pow parentheses radius comma two, and that would do that job. All right, so now you know about function calls, right? The point of this video is to talk about input formatting and output formatting. So let's talk about the in input formatting options in C++. First of all, in order to really understand that, you have to understand this detail about what's called the input, the input keyboard buffer, uh, the place in memory where the key presses on the keyboard initially go. Kind of an important detail here. So the keyboard buffer is an area of memory where a keyboard input is initially saved. Generally speaking, the word buffer means a place where something is being temporarily stored. So keep in mind that the sin right arrow extractor, that uh, double right angle bracket operator that I call right arrow, that's called the extractor when it's used for this, is taking information out of the keyboard buffer and it only reads up to the next white space. When we say white space, it could be a space or a tab or an enter, right? Something that produces a space that's not actually visible on screen, white space. So it only reads up to the very next white space and then that particular extraction statement stops doing anything. So if data remains in the keyboard buffer after that space, right, it's still gonna sit in that storage location, the buffer waiting for the next sin extraction statement. Right, so that's very important that there might be information left over waiting for the next SYN call. So we're about to see an example here of what if the user, when there was a SYN statement, typed in a whole bunch of stuff separated by spaces, and then if our code wanted to read out an int and a double and a char, a character, what exactly would get sucked in? What exactly would go in those variable locations? Okay, so let's say there's a SYN statement and our hypothetical user on the keyboard typed in 5.7 space, 4 space, B, and then the enter key, right? All of that stuff is gonna go into this keyboard buffer initially. Then the extractor is gonna come through and stay, start taking pieces out of it, okay? There's gonna be three SYN statements here that happen. Let's say the first statement, like it says on the slide, the first statement wants to pull out an int. Okay, so the sin starts reading on the left-hand side. There's a five, that's an integer. Then there's a point. Well, integers don't have points. So that first sin statement stops at that point and says, okay, five. There's the first integer here in the keyboard buffer, done. The first thing that comes out is five. Then the second statement, or the second sin statement will happen, and it won't wait for the user. Right? It will not wait for the user to type anything new, but it doesn't need to because there's already information in the keyboard buffer for it to read from. So without the user typing anything whatsoever, the second SYN statement comes through and it wants to pull out a double from this. So it's starting at the point, it sees the point, it sees the seven and there's the space and then it stops and what it's pulled out is 0.7. Or you might wanna write that down as 0.7. There is the double that it takes out. And then there's a third SYN statement, hypothetically, that wants to pull out a char. Again, it will not wait for the user to type anything. It's just gonna to go to the keyboard buffer, starting at that space, look at the next thing, go here's a four character, right? Here's the symbol for four. Here's another space, and that's where it stops. So for that character, it actually pulls out the, sim the symbol for four, the symbol for the digit four. It's not treating it like the number four, it's actually treating it like the character four. And then there's still that lowercase b still sitting in the keyboard buffer that we're not talking about. And that is, st so if there's, a, if there's a fourth sin statement, again, it's not gonna wait for the user, it's just gonna pull that b out for a fourth sin statement. So in this particular case, what gets into the int and the double and the char are a five and a 0.7 and a four. And now that's probably not what the user thought, right? It kind of looks like the human being user thought that the three things were gonna be 5.7 and a four and a B, but that is not what gets pulled into these data types. So maybe that's an error, right? Maybe the user typed things in the wrong order. Maybe they should have put four and 5.7 and B is maybe what they intended. Or maybe that's an, a logic error in the code that it isn't pulling things out in the right order for the SIN statements. So that kind of emphasizes why it's important to prompt clearly to users exactly what kind of thing they're supposed to type in next. The order of the input is very important, right? And if the user does type a whole lot of things, there'll be a lot of things sitting in the keyboard buffer, and then the SYN statements will all just run automatically from that point without waiting for the user to type anything more. So keep that in mind. 
For what it's worth, there are ways of erasing everything in the keyboard buffer. There's a command called, there's a function call, uh, called sin.ignore that will actually ignore or wipe out stuff in the keyboard buffer. That's a little bit advanced. I don't need to use that a lot, but maybe in future classes, we will, we will show you how to use the sin ignore to erase stuff in the keyboard buffer. Okay, so again, the sin, right, it stops reading at a space. Uh, normally that's fine, but maybe that's not what you want. If you want your input to include spaces, you have to do something else. You can't just use the sin object with the extractor operator. So here's a function to do that. It's called the getLine function, right? The name of the function is getLine. It takes two parameters, and the two parameters are actually the sin object itself. You write down sin, and the name of a string variable where the string is going to get stored. So the getLine function reads an entire string from the input stream, including all the spaces and the tabs, up to the return character. Includes all the spaces and tabs and, uh, and other types of white space. So this is a function that is defined in the library string, the header string. Fortunately, the string header itself is included in the IO stream header, at least in our compiler. So you do have access to this automatically as long as you're including IO stream, for what it's worth. And this will allow us to input full names, you know, with spaces, phrases, sentences, names of cities that have spaces, including all the spaces, right? So uh, sin does, you know, a lot of neat things. You can pull integers or floating points or characters, but if you do want a whole string with spaces, you need to use this getLine function. Let's look at that in a program. Here is program 319 in the book, and the lead comment there says, this program demonstrates using the getLine function to read character data into a string object. So we have included IO stream. They've also included the string header to be clear about that. I think on our system, that would be optional because IO stream itself includes the string header to my understanding. So here in the main function, um, as usual, they start off declaring some data. They've declared two string variables for name and city. Here comes the input phase of the program. Uh, prompt the user, please enter your name. And there on line 13 is a call to getLine. Right? The name of the function is getLine. Here's parentheses, so you know it's a function. And the two parameters for sin and the name variable, which is string data to receive whatever the user types in. And then line 14 prompts the user, please enter the city that you live in. And another function call to getLine. Right? Go to that sin object, pull out everything up to the next return, and store that in the city string variable. And finally, down here, there's no processing in this program. There's no calculations here. So at the end is the output phase, and it's going to print out, hello, whatever your name is. You live in whatever your city is. And that's this program. We should probably try this out. And here I've pulled up program 319 uh, out of the lecture code that comes with the book. I have it on screen here in DevC++. And obviously, this is a nicely written program here. I'm going to start off and I'm going to modify this to make a mistake. Okay, if I didn't know about the get, get line function, here's what I would probably try to do instead. Right, I'm asking the user to enter their name, and normally I would do sin right arrow into the name string variable. Just get rid of that. Right. Same thing here. Let's see what happens if we just try to do the normal sin extractor into city. Compile this. Compiles, right? Run it see what happens. So I'm going to enter my name, Dan Collins, right? And again, we what we expect next is we're going to get a prompt for please enter your city, and then it's going to say, hello, Dan Collins, and your city, you live in, uh, of course, I live in New York City here, so uh, that's what should happen next. Okay, uh, hmm, interesting. So you see, it didn't wait for me to answer the prompt, enter the city you live in, it just went right through that, and what it's saying here is, hello, Dan, you live in Collins. So that's what happens there if you try to use sin for that because it breaks it up on the spaces, right? When I typed in Dan Collins, and there's kind of two lessons here. When I typed in Dan Collins, that got put in the keyboard buffer. Then the extractor comes through and it pulls out the Dan. It stops at that space and only Dan got into the variable name. The Collins is still sitting in the keyboard buffer. So when the program got to line 15, it didn't even wait for me to type anything in. It just goes to the keyboard buffer. It says, hey, there's something in here, namely Collins. I'm going to pull that out, 
And that is what got saved for the city variable. So uh, two kind of slightly surprising things happen there, right? Um, clearly, the information that I intended isn't getting in the right places, and um, I'm being surprised about it blasting right through line 15, not waiting for me to type in anything, and uh, pulling out separate pieces of information that got into the keyboard buffer. So clearly, that's not going to work. Let's fix this to the way that the book actually provides. If I want to get input with spaces like my name and the city I live in, I'm going to have to use this get line function. And it's get line sin, name of the variable that you want to store stuff in. Same thing here. Okay, now let's try this. So now when it says, please enter your name, Dan Collins, right, the get line function is going to take that whole thing and store that in the name variable. Okay, now when it hits the sin statement on line 15, the keyboard buffer is now empty. Now it's going to pause and wait for me as the user to actually type in some more information. So now I can type in New York City, right? That goes in the keyboard buffer and the extractor pulls all, the get line function pulls all that stuff up to the enter line, goes into the city variable, and now it legitimately says, hello, Dan Collins, you live in New York City. And that's what you want. And anytime you have input with spaces, you've got to use the get line function like that. Hopefully that makes sense. Good. Okay, so that's the input story, right? Using get line and being careful about the keyboard buffer and exactly how sin works. So here we ought to talk about options for formatting your output here. Um, I'm going to try that again. So that's the input story, right? Being careful about how the sin object works and how it breaks up things on spaces. And if you do need spaces to use the get line function. So here's the story for output. C++ has a number of nice functions to format your output carefully on the screen. These are called the output stream manipulators. We use these to control how an output field is displayed. These are defined in the IO manip header. Now that's, again, the IO stands for input output and manip is short for manipulation. So it's the input output manipulation header, IO manip. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Once you include that header, you have, a, you have access to functions like these. I just pulled this table out of the book. So uh, there's the set W function, uh, set width. And what that says is the next thing that I print out with count it's going to fill up n spaces. So if I write down set w15, the next thing I write is going to take up 15 spaces on the screen is what's going to happen. Fixed, and these are all things you would actually send to the count object. Okay, so you'd write count, left arrow, and any one of these function calls. Fixed, here's a couple things that modify specifically how floating point numbers get displayed. So fixed says that we're going to display the floating point numbers in fixed point notation as opposed to scientific notation. Normally when floating point numbers get really, really big, it starts getting printed automatically in scientific notation with the E symbol, right? So 2E5 would be, mean two times 10 to the fifth power. Uh, if you don't wanna see that, even for large numbers, you can send in fixed and then that stops happening and you always see it like a normal decimal number. Show point causes a decimal point and trailing zeros to be displayed even if there's no fractional part. So if I have a floating point number that's just storing eight, okay, technically 8.00, normally that would get printed as eight. But if you have like a table for some reason and you want it to match up with the other numbers, you can use show point and you will definitely see 8.0. Set precision, right, takes one parameter. It's a function call, it takes one parameter. Set precision specifies how many decimal places you wanna see. So specifically, if you have the show point on Set precision five says I'm definitely going to see five places after the point for all the floating point numbers that I'm writing from now on, as a matter of fact. Keep in mind, those things do not affect how integers get printed out. That's a wholly different issue. Integers never have any decimal places. So fixed show point and set precision are modifying how floating point numbers get displayed. They don't have any effect on integers whatsoever. And then there's also manipulators left and right that indicate the next thing I, I, I uh, count out, do I want that to be left justified in the space or do I want it to be right justified in the space? And you have options for either one of those. 
Those are going to work in conjunction with the set W function that says the next space takes up this many spaces on the screen. And then within that location, you can either left justify it or you can right justify it. So I think for our work, we're probably going to be use, using set W quite a bit, and we're going to be using set precision function quite a bit to indicate how many decimal places. Here's an example of that. So program 317, this program asks for sales figures for three days, and the total sales are calculated and displayed in a table. So pretty simple. We declare uh, double variables, because this is going to be money, right? So we're going to use that to store the decimal part of the dollar and cents value. So we have doubles for day one, day two, day three in the total. Here's the input part of this program from lines 11 to 17. Prompt the user for the sales for day one, and the user sends some double number into day one. Same for day two, same for day three. Here's the processing calculating part here where we add up the sales values for day one, day two, day three, and assign that in the total. And at the bottom is sort of the interesting thing here is the output part, and we want to display a nice table. Now, think about how you like numbers in a table, right? Do you like them left justified or right justified? Well, you want them right justified because then the decimal places will all line up and that makes it easy to compare numbers in a table. So clearly with money like this, we're gonna to wanna to see two decimal places after the point for standard American currency, and we're gonna want it right justified so the points all line up, and that makes these things easy to compare. And you can see which ones are larger and which ones are smaller very easily. So we get the header to a table. It's gonna print sales figures on the screen. Notice that there's the new line escape character. I could have been writing end line for that, but writing a couple slash ends is a lot shorter. Not too surprising, kind of underline it. Line 25 sets the precision in the count to two places. So we see two places after the point. We're also setting up fixed, just in case it's super huge, it doesn't go into scientific notation. Look carefully at line 25, right? Because these are being used in the context of a count statement. You're sending these, the results of these function calls to the count statement. And then on line 26, it's gonna print out day one. Here's the set W function call. We're setting up a field of width eight. So the next thing that gets printed, namely the double precision number that's in day one, is gonna fill up eight spaces and it's automatically, because it's a number, get right justified in that space because that's what you normally want. And then same thing for day two, right? It's providing a field of eight spaces for your number. Same thing for day three and same thing for the total. So that's what's gonna make these numbers all line up very carefully. We should take a look at that. So here I have program 317 up from the Gaddis lecture code repository. And just like we saw in the lecture slide, uh, we're including IO manip. That's really the interesting thing here. So some input, some processing. But the thing we're keeping an eye on is what happens with that set precision two function call and also what is happening with these set width eight function calls. So let's compile this and let's test this. So for an interesting test, I want to use numbers of different sizes. So just for argument's sake, let's say we have a tiny little lemonade stand or something like that. And on Friday, there's not many people around and we make $15 in sales, right? That's going to go into the day one variable. Now on Saturday, it's really hot and we make a lot more money. Let's say we make $125 and 65 cents. Okay. And then Sunday, not quite so many people around. And let's say we make $55 and 60 cents. Okay, so uh, the processing happened and got totaled. Here is our nice little table. Every single dollar amount is being printed with two decimal places. That's what the set precision two did. Even if my input, like with 15, I didn't type it in there, but the output is still gonna see the dot zero zero because of the set precision two. Um, same thing for day three, actually. Hypothetically, if you wrote down 55.6, that's the same number, but set precision two make confirms that you're gonna get two decimal places. The other thing is that this is lined up the way that you would expect in a table. The cents places lined up in each number, the dimes places lined up, the points are lined up, right? The ones and the tens and the hundreds places are lined up. So that makes it a lot easier to compare numbers in a table. And that's the action that the set width did. It said, we're gonna have eight spaces but the numbers are gonna get right justified, and that's what lines up the points properly for our numbers, so we like that. 
just hypothetically, let me go through and break this. Okay, so if I didn't have these set width calls, this table would not nearly be as pretty. So I'll just remove all those set width calls and test that again. Again, a proper test here, I need numbers with different sizes. So I'll put in 5.65 and 25.78 and 1,024, and you see how they're, they're lined up differently here? Without set width, it just immediately starts printing it because it doesn't know how many spaces you really want. So now the points aren't lined up, and it's, and it's a lot harder to compare these numbers and see exactly which one is bigger or smaller. So that's why we like that set width function, specifically when you're making tables like this because it does keep the columns lined up like you would expect. Very handy. Okay, so there's a couple of options for formatting input and output in C++ with console text-driven programs. And for input, it's important to be aware of how SYN works. It breaks up the input tokens on spaces. The keyboard buffer is holding extra information if the user types in a whole lot of stuff, and the SYN calls will pull them out there first, even if the user doesn't have to type anything. If you do want input including spaces, you're going to have to use the get line function for that kind of input. And then on the output angle, you have IO manipulators like set W to space a table nicely, or set precision to indicate how many decimal places in a floating point number you have. So those will all be very, very useful going forward. At this point, uh, for my in-person classes, we would do this table on formatting output. And you can see here this program should let the user input a price and a quantity for two separate items, maybe you're buying in a store, and display that data in a well-formatted table with two rows and two columns. So kind of similar to the example that we saw here for IO manipulation. We would definitely want to use set precision to make the money decimals look the right size, and we would definitely want to use set the set W function to make sure that those numbers are lined up as you would expect in a nicely formatted table. Keep that in mind for future assignments. If there's any assignment that says print out the information in a table format, you're definitely going to want to look back here and use that set W function in particular to get your columns lined up nicely. So do keep that in mind. When we come back next time, we're going to be looking at more sophisticated math functions, things that might do trigonometry for you in C++. We haven't talked about that too much yet. And also ways that you can debug your program, features that uh, will allow you to figure out what's wrong in your program, track what's happening in memory currently, and as our programs get more complicated, uh, be able to be aware of what's happening internally and fix stuff when we need them. So that'll be next time, and I'll look forward to that. I'll see you then.